we're live. Over to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening to you, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to our IDEO session. Um, we'd just like to start by having people complete the Mentimeter link, which has a question popping up in the chat. Um, so you've got your link um, in the chat and you follow that link and there's a question which is, tell us what you think are the biggest issues for children in an infectious disease outbreak. Um, so if you can fill that in for us now, we'll have a word cloud appear. So tell us what are the biggest issues for children in an infectious disease outbreak. So click on the Menti link in your chat um, and start completing that Menti link. Um, and we'll be able to see a cloud of what your views are and get a sense of um, patterns in, in terms of people's perspectives on that. So for those of you just arriving, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. We'd love you to click the link in the chat, follow that through to the website and put in what you think are the biggest, biggest issues for children uh, in an infectious disease outbreak. Um, so we can see mental health is coming out really strongly, lack of protection, access to services, violence in the home, um, lots of different um, isolation, loneliness, exploitative behavior, school disruption, um, information isn't child friendly. Um, yeah, getting, what am I seeing there? MHPSS is coming in separately as mental health. So I think that's coming and psychological distress. That's coming up quite strongly. Um, fear of being infected, lack of protection, um, distance from parents. Um, okay, well, people do feel free to continue to fill that in as people are joining. Um, Audrey, shall I hand over to you to open the session? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Wow, the introduction to the strategic plan was amazing, and I'm sure you are all eager now to read it. However, before doing so, time has come for our last session of the day. A year ago, during the 2020 annual meeting, we all gathered to discuss and reflect on the global COVID-19 pandemic, and in general, on infectious disease outbreaks and child protection. We have continued our work around IDOs and child protection, and today we will, you will hear about some of our progresses and ways forward. We will also have the pleasure to have a short introduction to the silent pandemic, which is a presentation addressing MHPSS prevention and IDOs. The full discussion will take place after this session in the coffee lounge, so please join us at uh, 6.30 p.m. CET. Meanwhile, it is my pleasure to introduce Nidhi Kapoor and Hannah Thompson. Nidhi and Hannah are independent child protection consultant commissioned by the Alliance and the Ready Initiative to first update the guidance note on the protection of children during infectious disease outbreaks, and two, explore broader questions of intersectoral collaboration in the context of infectious disease outbreaks. Ladies, the floor is yours. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, thank you, Audrey, for the introduction. So I'm Hannah Thompson. Um, I'll just quickly run through the outline of the session so everyone can be clear um, on what we're gonna be talking about uh, in this session. Uh, so we'll give a bit of background to the work that Nidhi and I have been doing on this uh, intersection between health and child protection and, and the update of the IDEO guidance note. Um, we'll run through some questions that come from the Focal Point team, the COVID Focal Point team who've been working with the Alliance over the last year and a half. Um, we'll talk about some preparatory work that's already taken place in terms of preparing for the updating of the IDEO guidance note. Um, we're very excited to have a presentation from the people who've developed the report, The Silent Pandemic. Um, in particular, we've got uh, Judith from Columbia, who's a young person who's going to express some of the uh, issues that they've been facing that are documented in that report. 
Um, and then we want to get some feedback and thoughts from yourselves as to what you would want the next IDEO guidance note uh, to look like. So um, we're kind of very open at the moment. It's not intended necessarily to be exactly the same format and style as the previous version from 2018. So we want to get your perspectives on what um, future guidance might look like. And then we'll wrap up and close uh, for the day. We'll hand over to Audrey to close for the day. Next slide, please. Um, just to highlight some key ways of working. So um, we'd welcome your interaction. Uh, you can put questions throughout uh, the session into the chat. Audrey will be monitoring that for us and highlight any questions that come up. Uh, do feel free to use the Zoom reaction buttons, which are at the bottom of your screen. So if you like something, if you don't understand something, uh, if you want us to stop, um, please do kind of use the reaction so we can know if um, we're going too fast uh, or things aren't clear. Um, we have a number of different polls and activities so that we can get your inputs and feedback during the session. Um, we'll put um, Mentimeter links into the chat. Um, and um, yeah, and there'll sometimes be questions where we want you just to type your answers into the chat. Um, so do uh, follow the instructions that we give you. Um, and we ask that people stay on mute, but we quite welcome that you put your video on so that we can see you and we can uh, gauge your reactions to things so we can see if uh, things are of interest to you uh, or if we're putting you to sleep because it might be early in the morning where you are or late at night. Um, okay, thank you very much. Slide, please. So in terms of a bit of a background to the, to the updating of the ODI guidance note and the process that Nidhi and I have been working on so far. Can we go to the next slide? Um, it, uh, in 2014-2015, there was an Ebola crisis in West Africa, which I imagine most of you are aware of. And this obviously uh, was a great challenge for child protection actors and made us have to relook at the way we implemented our interventions and really adapt ourselves um, to something that we weren't really experienced in. Uh, and on the back of lessons learned from that process, um, the 2018 guidance note on the protection of children during infectious disease outbreaks was written. Um, and then now the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action is collaborating with the READY initiative to update the IDEO guidance note to kind of look at further lessons learned um, that have um, come about since, since then. Um, the link for the READY initiative for those who want to know a bit more about the READY initiative should appear in your chat. If we can go to the next slide, please, as well. Um, and so this updated uh, guidance note that we're, hope that we're planning to produce um, soon uh, will reflect both the release of the 2019 CPMS, which integrated more strongly um, the need for um, recognition of the differences of implementing in an IDEO uh, setting. Um, it will include new learning and guidance that's come about from the 2019-2020 Ebola epidemic in DRC, and then also reflect the 2021 COVID-19 pandemic, um, because so much guidance has come out over this time. Um, and it will also consider more strongly intersectoral co collaboration and integration in line with the Alliance's next strategy um, and consider entry points to working on health issues such as mental health and psychosocial support, um, which is a, a sort of natural ally of, of child protection and health both. Um, next slide, please. So I'll now hand over to Tim Williams, who uh, will help us to reflect a bit on what's happened uh, over the last 18 months uh, and think through the, the numerous uh, guidance documents that the COVID focal point team has produced uh, and how our lessons can be learned on how useful they've been in terms of integrating those into the IDEO guidance note development. Thank you, Tim. Great, thanks so much, Anna. Um, hi, everyone. As Hannah mentioned, uh, my name is Tim Williams, and I'm a, a co-lead or co-contributor of the COVID-19 focal point for the Alliance. And as you're aware, in response to COVID, the Alliance has produced many, many uh, guidance notes, technical notes, evidence syntheses, webinars, podcasts, trainings, and other tools. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and as you know, the pandemic is still very much ongoing. Um, and there's a healthy need to reflect on the work um, done by the ELIN so far in order to better ensure that it continues to be the needs of its members. To this end, we're in the early phases of planning and evaluation of the Alliance's response to COVID. Um, and to help with this effort, um, we're gonna ask you um, just for a couple of your responses to three of our kind of our formative evaluation questions right now in our session today. Uh, and your answers will be one component of helping to ensure that outputs like the IDO guidance are best aligned to the situation and needs of the Alliance members. And just so you know, um, you know, in order to keep the session moving, we won't be able to properly debrief the survey findings here today. But I do hope what we can do is that when we see the responses come in, um, they can give us pause to think about the efforts to date that we've made, um, and also to lay the groundwork for um, not only the evaluation, um, but further work. Uh, so with that said, um, I'd like you to please consider the efforts of the Alliance and in your response to the following three Mentimeter questions. Um, so if you could put the first one in the chat, please. Great, so if you click on the Mentimeter link, um, the question will be asking you, um, overall, how satisfied have you been with the Alliance's response to COVID-19? And you can select one answer between very satisfied or very dissatisfied. And hopefully we'll be able to see those uh, responses populate in the um, Mentimeter. This is my first Mentimeter chat and it's so cool to see right now. All right, um, so that's giving you an idea that we've got some neutrals, we've got, you know, uh, leaning toward the, the positive side. Um, responses are still coming in. Let me give you a couple more seconds. All right, thank you. So it looks like uh, there's generally a, a decent amount of satisfaction so far with the response. In the actual evaluation, um, which we're still planning, we'll tend to um, examine some of these perceptions in a bit more detail, um, but, uh, but it's great to see uh, that, uh, this type of feedback so far. Uh, the second Mentimeter question, if you could put it in the link, uh, please is, um, and this one you can select more than one. Uh, the question is, since the pandemic began, which of the Alliance resources have you or your organization used or utilized? So it looks like a combination of guidance notes, webinars, evidence syntheses, uh, MOOC. All right, thank you. This is helpful to see that um, it seems like, uh, you know, a wide range of uh, resources are being utilized, um, perhaps by, by the same members or, or different ones as well. Um, but these types of utilization will also plan to explore in further details um, in, the, um, in uh, the, the actual evaluation itself. I'm noting um, Allison um, uh, notes that the networking site is something she's also um, uh, pointed out. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Allison. Um, the final question is question number three, and that's um, an open-ended question. And would you, we'd like you to take one minute to write how you or your organization um, have used COVID-19 resources produced by the Alliance. 
So just take a, a couple of seconds to, to think about that uh, utilization. And um, I think you're able to, to answer, uh, provide open-ended responses in your um, uh, in Menti. So some of the examples so far are to uh, adjust our approaches to protecting children, uh, to ensure a no harm approach to programming, um, to adapt approaches for creation of our own guidelines, uh, to design the new projects and refocus strategic direction, inform programming, training, and capacity building, uh, to write other country level guidance, um, to ensure consistency in messaging from child protection responders. Great. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is really, uh, the idea is to give a taster about the types of uh, ways that partners have utilized uh, uh, COVID related resources. And we're going to um, uh, aggregate uh, these responses in order to think thematically about which ones to explore in more depth in the evaluation itself. Uh, so I'm really grateful for your, um, ability, your uh, willingness to provide these responses um, around advocacy, responding to child protection issues um, and so on. Uh, but due to the time constraints, I'm now gonna hand it over to my, um, my colleague, Nidhi Kapoor uh, for the next uh, uh, component of this uh, presentation. Thank you, Tim. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Julia. So just to give you a bit of background on the preparatory work that's been happening um, these last few months on the updated guidance note, um, I think Hannah and I started this work back in April. Um, next slide, please. I'll just give you um, a, a bit of background on the key steps that have already been taken. Um, so back, I think it was the beginning of May, um, we did put together an online survey together with um, the COVID Focal Point team. Um, and that online survey went out with the May newsletter of the Alliance, um, which I think has a mailing um, membership of over 6,000 members. Um, with the support of um, Translators Without Borders, we were able to produce that survey in four languages, in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and we were really hoping for um, a bit more uptake. Unfortunately, we only had um, 39 uh, respondents, the majority of which were in English. Um, but we did get some useful first indications. Uh, we had asked um, who had used the, the, the original 2018 guidance note and 50% of respondents had said that they had used it before and 80% had said that they found it useful or extremely useful. Um, but then 15, 50% said they preferred a different format and 30% said they wanted additional content. So that was kind of the first step in just getting a, you know, feeling out the picture of what people might want. Um, and then after that, we undertook a series of key informant interviews. Um, and we did a, you know, a combination of hybrid interviews looking at the question of, you know, the broader question of intersectoral collaboration between child protection and health in infectious disease outbreaks, um, as well as specific questions related to guidance and what people are wanting to see. Um, and we, we spent time, I think, with 33 key informants. Um, and we tried to take a multi-sectoral approach even to that consultation process. So while 17 key informants were within the child protection sector, we also had 15 key informants from the health sector and two from education and emergencies um, or looking at the bridge between education emergencies and child protection. And we also had one from MHPSS. So um, we also tried to purposively sample key informants that came from the global level, HQ, regional level, as well as from the field level. Um, and so all of that combined um, complemented the desk review that was happening in the background. 
Um, the desk review was primarily conducted by an intern, um, Dr. Lucho, who um, again has a health background. He's a physician by training. Um, who came in to help Hannah and I um, produce an annotated bibliography. Um, that bibliography is almost completed and um, was done with the support also of um, Bethel in the COVID-19 focal point team. Um, and we hope that that annotated bibliography, by the way, um, could be a useful resource in and of itself um, to others that might be writing guidance or uh, wanting to refer to what's the latest um, out there. It consists primarily of academic articles um, and uh, toolkits, uh, other gray literature from other NGOs, UN actors um, in relation to not just COVID-19, but also to other infectious disease outbreaks um, like cholera, like Ebola, SARS, MERS. We had a, a selection criteria that we had developed together. And then on top of that, we've had oversights um, and technical support from an advisory group consisting of, um, again, actors at the HQ levels of various organizations, as well as um, some civil society and local organizations um, at the field level. Um, next slide, please. So today we wanted to present to you some of the key findings um, from, from, from our stakeholder consultation. Um, and uh, they primarily fall into these different categories, which we'll spend time going through a little bit later in today's session. Um, audience, the format, structure, review, as well as the dissemination channels that we might take. So we'll go into those, each of those in more detail in a few minutes. Um, but what, 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 what was really strongly emphasized was the need for intersectoral collaboration. Uh, for an integrated uh, prevention and response to infectious disease outbreaks. Um, so that came out very strongly and it's great to see it reflected also in the Alliance's new strategy. Um, and there was also kind of a general consensus that such guidance was required. I think there was a feeling that the 2018 guidance was the very first time that child protection and infectious disease outbreaks were put together. It was, it was the first time that these two topics were kind of put together in a formal way and really looked at um, and of course, so much has happened since then with Ebola in Eastern DRC, and of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there's consensus that there is a need for an updated guidance note, um, which is a great starting point. Um, and as Hannah mentioned earlier, we see MHPSS as one key entry point, and we're lucky to have um, speakers from the silent pandemic um, to, to support our discussion today and illustrate how uh, an integrated response um, can take place in an infectious disease setting. Next slide, please. So I'll hand over to Audrey to introduce our speakers more formally. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now we are going to listen uh, to a presentation uh, by World Vision International and World Child. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this session, the full presentation and in-depth discussion uh, will take place after this session in the coffee lounge. So please, for the ones who are interested in learning more, uh, I would like to invite you to uh, follow us after uh, the session ends. But for the time being, I am very pleased to welcome Juliette Pacheco Gomez, apology if I'm not saying your name right, my dear, who is a youth advocate from Colombia. Um, and I would like as well to introduce uh, Juan Jose Castellanos Psidrahita. Uh, again, apology if I'm not uh, introducing your, your name correctly. Uh, but we are very happy to have you on board and to get that uh, teaser around the silent pandemic before we will move to the coffee lounge after this session. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is, as, as Audrey said it, uh, is Juan Jose Castellanos. I'm a psychologist and I'm the child protection coordinator for War Child in Colombia. Uh, I will be doing a brief presentation of the silent pandemic report, which analyzes the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on mental health, psychosocial well-being of children in conflict-affected uh, countries. As Audrey said, we will be doing it with Juliet, who is a youth advocate from 
Colombia. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction, World Challenge World Vision joined forces during 2020 to design and conduct this research in order to evaluate how psychosocial well-being was being affected by COVID-19, also aiming at making visible the voices of children and the needs of children and youth during the pandemic. We spoke to 220, uh, next slide please before. <laughs> um, uh, and next one, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that one. Uh, we spoke to 220 children, uh, 287 parents and caregivers, 245 leaders in six affected countries, uh, uh, 44 child protection experts and community leaders and in, in six affected countries that will be Colombia, uh, OPT, Lebanon, Jordan, South Sudan, and the Demographic, uh, Democratic Republic of, of Congo. Uh, before sharing the, the results, I, I want to introduce again Juliet and, and, and give her the room now. Juliet, if you want to unmute yourself or start your video. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Now we can, thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you so much Juan Jose for this uh, introduction. So hello everyone again, I'm Juliet Pacheco. I'm 25 years old and I'm from Colombia. Today is a special day because we are able to share our story at this important child protection meeting. Children and young people matter now more than ever. Our development, our growth, our well-being matters too. We can only grow and develop if we, the youth, are a meaningful part of society. Youth is a decisive stage in the life of any human being. It is a key moment for our life plans in which we want to develop our potential to the maximum, access to opportunities, develop ourselves in a social and emotional way. But we need several conditions that are essential for this development, such as a protective family and a supportive community environment. Prior to the pandemic in Colombia, young people already lived in situation of stress and anxiety because of the social inequality and lack of access to opportunities. So the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated this pre-existing situation. It has not been easy for anyone and our society is still recovering. Today, I am the voice of 18 year old Andres who during the pandemic said he felt scared and worried about his parents' unemployment. And, um, and I'm also the voice of 15 year old Carolina who has been worried about the lack of access to economical resources. In this way, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it social crisis and consequences that have repercussions on the lives of millions of families and therefore on the lives of the young people. In the silent pandemic study conducted by Warshall and World Vision uh, identified that family poverty and food insecurity in a 38% is a chief concern for children. This is further supported by, a 20, uh, by an UNICEF 2020 survey, where the 30% of young people say that the main reason influencing their current emotions is the economic situation. So because of the loss of employment in families, more responsibility has fallen on young people to provide income to uh, their households, producing stress and anxiety. I'm also the voice of 13 year old Jose, who is worried about not being able to see his friends or go to school anymore. And the voice of Natalie, who could no longer frequent areas of interaction with others, because we, the youth, of, uh, uh, we have lar largely lost our spaces for interaction and relationship with our peers because of social distancing and also because of the infection prevention measures. So in this way, we have been feeling uh, lonely and isolated. We must bear in mind that the school's activities will represent an important space for socialization, have moved to the virtual world. And the reality is that in many young people in different locations in Colombia are isolated 
generating frustration, pessimism, and uncertainty about the future. Countless households in Colombia report symptoms associated with the deterioration of the mental health of children and youth. Between March and April of 2020, there was more than 142 increase in calls uh, and 42 increase in calls in the uh, violence support line compared to 2019. And that's why I'm the voice today of Maria, Claudia, Mariana, Luz, Estela, Pedro, Ana, and Mario, who during the pandemic were concerned and afraid about domestic abuse. This increased abuse co-determinates the psychosocial well-being and the ability to develop of young people. This is our new and very challenging reality that calls all of us to act. This requires the efforts of all parts of society because the young owners of these voices, voices that I brought today, are waiting for protection, support, answers, a cure uh, to this deep and so to the social crisis we are living at this moment. The cure for their aggravated anxieties and worries because today more than ever, children and youth matter. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet, for that. Um, I just want to point out that um, an important finding of this, of this research was that 57% of children and youth um, said that needed psychosocial support and this number rose up to 70% uh, for displaced children. This is three times um, the pre-COVID estimate that were 22, 22% only. Um, and I just want to point out that also basic services, education, family support, health services were also reported um, as being needed by children and youth in, in this report. Uh, can I have the next, next slide, please? Uh, when considering child protection issues and, and considerations, uh, we can see that there's a huge gap in how children and youth report, um, they, uh, report that they have someone that they can look for help. We see that youth for youth, there's less and less um, youth that can get someone and refer someone to, to ask for help. Um, also, we can, we can see that children and youth report it that services, activities, playgrounds, and food became less available because of the pandemic. Um, this is specifically important since cultural and sports activities, um, school and safe play playgrounds were spaces that protected children from recruitment and utilization by armed groups here in, in Colombia. Now that these activities have been diminished, they're more vulnerable and, and school are still closed closed and activities are still being less available in many, many countries. Um, can I have the, the next slide, please? Um, regarding the, the main recommendations, we just want to point out briefly that it is very important to integrate MH, PSS and child protections alongside with, with other sectors. Um, I wanted to point out that there's two, um, two standards in the CPMS that, that gets us into this direction that are the standard 10 and the standard 15. Um, I want to present uh, just one more uh, brief recommendation and that it is important to, to provide life skills programs and strengthen of social emotional skills alongside with child protection uh, interventions of prevention and response. Um, this is, this is becoming very important, especially um, as an example from the situation that it, too many children and youth are living in uh, here, that they're locked down many times with their abuses, their abusers, uh, they're suffering from um, emotional violence, physical violence, um, sexual violence, and especially gender violence too. Um, so it is very important to also face on the prevention side, but to moreover, um, go one step further and integrate uh, MHPSS with child protection. Um, since, since we're running out of time and we're running short of time, um, I just want to invite you all to, to the coffee launch. Uh, after this session, we will discuss this, this further. Uh, we will discuss the needs uh, of children, the key actions that we can think of as, as, as the humanitarian sector. Um, and thank you, thank you all.
Great. Thank you so much, both uh, Juan and Juliet. And believe me, I'll be there uh, at the coffee lounge because definitely I want to discuss more all those points uh, moving forward. Uh, we will be meeting in the gathering place. Um, now, without any further delay, I will hand over the floor to Nidhi. Nidhi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Um, next slide, please, Julia. Thank you. So this is the part where we get to hear from you. I think we've done quite a lot of talking. Um, next slide, please. We want to hear your views on the IDEO's guidance note update and what it should look like. Um, so like I mentioned, there's different components to the guidance note update um, and I sort of group them thematically. The first question that we wanted to ask is who is this guidance note targeted towards? Because of course, we could gear it towards that HQ or managerial level or towards frontline workers. And that would be quite different, I think, in terms of what, what the content would be and how it would be presented. Um, and we've also thought about the different levels. Are we talking about frontline workers at the community level or rather at the national level um, or even at the regional level? Um, and then there's the question of what sector? Are we gearing this new guidance note only towards the child protection sector? Um, or are we thinking about connections to health, um, MHPSS, uh, WASH, et cetera? Um, and what about donors? Because we have seen um, through some of the evaluation work that was done on the guidance notes that came out during um, the COVID-19 pandemic that donor, uh, donors and donor governments were also downloading and using um, these different pieces of technical guidance that were coming out of the Alliance. So please go ahead and use the Mentimeter um, link um, to give your feedback on, uh, on the audience. I think we can do a little ranking exercise um, it should be the same Mentimeter link that you had at the beginning of the session. Um, maybe Julia or Katrina could help to put it back into the chat. Thank you. There we go. So go ahead and click on that link and let us know who do you think should be the main target audience. Um, so we can get a sense of the profile that we're gearing this new guidance note towards. Julia, is there a way for us to see the, the results come up on the screen? Sorry, yes, I, I had it up and then I'm just getting it back up. Thank so you. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, hopefully everyone is filling it out and then by the time it comes up, we'll be able to see the results. Yep, bear with me. Okay, I got it, here we go. Thank you. It's maybe the next page. I was going to say that's the wrong side, oh. Julie. Yeah. Apologies. Oh, there's lots here. It's not. It's, it's it's not this one either. It's the question that says rank who you believe this guidance is targeted. There you go. So oh, anyone sorry. anyone that was um, clicking the link, if it didn't show up with the right question, um, please click back into it. Or if you go to it now, it will be on the correct question. Sorry about that. OK, let's give this another 30 seconds then just to give everyone a chance to respond. There we go. There are the results coming in now. So, so far we have country level ahead, but closely followed by frontline workers um, and a strong interest in gearing it towards child protection practitioners only um, in third place. So of course we have the other actors um, and much less interest in gearing it towards donors or at the global level uh, towards managers. So that's quite an interesting result. So thanks so much. Um, let's see how it continues to evolve as more, as more people respond. It's interesting to also see that health has creeped up there um, in third place. So thank you very much. Please continue to populate this. Um, and we, Hannah and I will analyze these results um, as we decide on ways forward um, with the Alliance um, when we sit down to actually write the guidance note. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. handing over to Hannah okay. as well. Yeah, I'll, so um, I'd like now to talk to a little bit about uh, format. Um, so what kind of uh, presentation the guidance would have. Uh, as I said earlier on in the session, 
Um, we don't expect that it has to look exactly the same way as the previous IDEO guidance note did. We'd like it to be user friendly. We'd like it to be something um, that is what uh, the end users would actually want and find most easy to use. Um, so sort of Nidhi and I were thinking, what, what are our big questions? You know, will it uh, be a sort of simplified guidance, which is made up of very short uh, checklists and tip sheets, which is sort of the next option, but, or would it be something that's very comprehensive, A to Z, uh, every step of the program management cycle covering everything globally in one, in one toolkit? Um, so if we start by looking at one example, which is the ACE toolkit, the um, alternative care and emergencies toolkit that many of you may already know, um, it is a very comprehensive piece of guidance. I think it's about 160 pages. Um, but if you look down the um, left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that when you look at the correct view of the PDF, there are all these annexes uh, attached to the Alternative Care and Emergencies Toolkit. And those you can extract. You just click on one and it will ping onto your computer and you can use it. And if they're in Word version, you can adapt it. So in a way, it's a sort of um, a compromise between uh, these simplified checklists and tools that are all available as annexes and this very comprehensive guidance uh, that has links back to those um, annexes. So this is one kind of format that could be uh, interesting and an option. Um, do you want to go back to the PowerPoint? Um, and then will I say that the next one is the camp management toolkit. So maybe it's easier um, if we go straight straight to the camp management toolkit. Um, so, sorry. So uh, another alternative option would be to have just a separate a series of short checklist tip sheets that would be all found in one location on a website, on a USB key, in a zip file. Um, and th those would each be very practical and very related to the sort of work you're implementing that you would just take one of those tip sheets you wouldn't need to take a whole guidance document with you and so one example of this is the camp management toolkit um, so we don't necessarily have the funding to make it look like this <laughs> but um, if you look at the camp management toolkit there's different sections so we'll zoom in on the protection section um, and then the protection section has a set of key messages, which if you printed it out would probably fit on one or two sides of A4. And then when you sort of scroll down, I think it's the, if we go on the side up a bit, uh, somewhere there's the introduction, isn't there? Ah, oh, there we go there. Under protection, there's the word introduction. Um, and then you see that there's kind of little uh, tip sheets and uh, box text and different documents that so it might we wouldn't have the funding necessary to produce something like this online but we might be able to produce a series of of short documents that address specific situations and topics um, that people could use rather than having one printable large pdf file now should we go back to the powerpoint presentation um, and then, yeah, so the, fi the final option is the idea of having a, sort of a simple one document like the I previous IDEO guidance was um, that is printable um, or is a published PDF um, that we disseminate globally. Um, so uh, rather than do another poll or vote, we felt like it would be good to have people share in the chat on the left. So if you click on the chat button below, if you don't have the chat appearing at the moment on the side, and then put in uh, links to any key guidance that you use at the moment that you find particularly user-friendly. Um, so any uh, other resources, it can be from any sector that you've always thought, oh, I find that really easy to navigate. I find it really easy to use. Um, and I suggest that any future guidance uh, should look a bit like this. Um, so great, uh, I can see people are, are responding to that. Um, I've seen a request for uh, the link. Is it the link from, it's from Haja who's requested the link. Is that for the Mentimeter from earlier? Or is it the link to one of the documents? 
um, that we've just shown. I'm sending the links in the chat now. So hopefully Great. whichever links they're looking for, apologies for my okay. delay there. Um, whatever Thank links you. they're looking for will be included. Thank you, Katrina. That's great. Um, and then, yeah, so the GBV pocket guy we're familiar with. Uh, someone mentioned a child friendly spaces um, disaster response toolkit. It'd be great if you could give a link to that because I've seen quite a lot of different um, guidance on child friendly spaces. So if you could spend, send a link to the specific one you're talking about, that would help us a lot to know uh, which one you find useful. Um, great to hear that someone found the old idea guidance note um, very useful and practical. So please do keep sharing options in the chat um, and also contact us if you want uh, with um, advice on, on guidance uh, design that we could follow um, after this session. That's That would be great. We'd be happy to receive that. Should we go to the next slide and I'll hand back to Nidhi. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. So, I mean, very closely linked to um, kind of the format is the question of structure. Um, and this, um, you know, pertains also to the question of who the audience is for our guidance notes. Um, of course, within the child protection and humanitarian action sort of fields, we follow the CPMS. There's the four pillars and the 28 standards that everyone is familiar with here in this audience. Um, but outside of our sector, um, it's not so uh, well known and people are not so well versed in the CPMS. Um, and so linking our guidance directly to the CPMS kind of closes the door, I think, to other sectors necessarily accessing it and feeling like it's something that they own and that they co-created. Um, so <clears throat> something to consider would be, and this comes from uh, recommendations from uh, from some of our key informants would be to, um, to structure the, uh, the updated guidance note around infectious, infectious disease outbreak response pillars. So there's typically around eight response pillars that WHO usually uh, would, would, um, would, uh, you know, would work with the national government in question to design their country response plan or preparedness plan. And so that would be things like risk communication and community engagements, um, things like um, uh, safe and dignified burials, uh, case management. So there would be those kinds of IDO kind of response pillars, and we could explain how child protection could be mainstreamed into those different um, response areas or preparedness areas, as well as I think would be also additional as a standalone child protection interventions that as a sector we would want to take forward um, so I think there's a way to kind of blend both the mainstreaming as well as the standalone child protection programming. So I'd like you to vote. Um, I know it's not as simple as black and white, but just curious to know where people's mind is at in terms of the preference to go down the CPMS only route or to look at um, infectious disease outbreak response pillars as an option in terms of how to organize the content of the um, guidance note. Um, so go ahead and use the Mentimeter link. Um, the same one as before, there should be a question now to vote between the two options. Um, right now we're at 50-50. <laughs> so probably where we are too in our minds, Hannah and I. Um, so let's see if there's more responses coming in in a couple of minutes. And indeed, if people have ideas on um, how to take a hybrid approach or indeed an entirely different approach, then please do uh, then to, please do put those ideas in the chat and we'll we'll analyze them later after this session. Um, very curious to know. Thank you. Allison has asked for the Mentimeter link again. I think it's just been shared. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who maybe already had it open, just click for the next question. Thanks, Julia. So right now we're at 6040 leaning towards CPMS. Great, so we'll move on from there um, just because of time. And uh, we're reflecting around the 50-50 mark um, and we'll look at uh, the next aspect of the guidance note with Hannah, thank you. Okay, so if we can have the next slide, please. So another discussion point for us has been 
um, who should review the, the draft guidance note. Um, so when we come to write sections of the material, um, we'd like to share it with people and get their feedback um, and adjust it according to, to that feedback. Um, so currently we have an advisory group, um, so we could um, would share it with the advisory group members. Um, uh, Nidhi, I don't know if you want to remind us who the advisory group members are. I meant to write it down, I've forgotten who they are. Um, yeah, the, um, the advisory group members, we have IRC, we have the CPAOR, we have um, BFED from Congo, a CS a civil society organization. Um, and we have Susanna from the CPMS working group as well. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten someone else. But, Plan uh, yeah. International. Plan International, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And Audrey. Uh, and I think UNHCR as well, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. UNHCR just came on board. Yeah, great. Thank you. Sorry, my mind went blank. Oh, and the MHPSS reference group as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so advisory group members, the key informants who we engaged, so it was 33 people that Nidhi mentioned that are at various different levels, global, regional, country level, uh, and they cut across health, MHPSS and child protection and education. Uh, representatives from other sectors, for example, MHPSS health, uh, WASH, food security, um, et cetera, et cetera, all the other sectors uh, and donors. Um, so I think, you know, we we'd probably look at a range of these different options, but we'd be really keen if you wanted to pop your names again in the chat. Um, but if you were willing to volunteer and would be interested in reviewing some of the material, um, if you put your names in the in the chat on the side. Uh, and your email address, even more useful. Um, and then we'd be able to share, uh, you know, get in touch with you and share uh, sections of the material at a later date. So it wouldn't necessarily be that you have to review the whole of the guidance document. It might be that you're just interested in certain topics um, and then we can, you know, tailor what you review to what your expertise is or, you know, where you felt uh, it was suitable to intervene. We don't yet have a timeline for when we'll be developing the material. Um, so you have to bear with us whilst we prepare a work plan for the next piece of the next stage of the IGEO guidance development. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so in terms of dissemination, um, we wanted to discuss a bit how the guidance notes should be shared more widely. So. Uh, through the Alliance, obviously that, that will take place automatically. Um, it would get sent out through the newsletter and be published on the website and Facebook, et cetera. Um, but are there other strategies that we can take to share through, for example, the Global Health Cluster, uh, other platforms, for example, the MHS, uh, MHPSS reference group monthly calls. So these are ideas we've had um, when there are global meetings of these other sector actors, we could, um, you know, look to try and present in their in their meetings. Um, and then, you know, depending on funding again, uh, we could accompany it by podcasts and webinars, um, workshops for sort of wider rollout uh, and social media posts, um, et cetera. Um, so these kind of also depend a bit on funding and access. You know, if we asked to go to the health cluster meeting, we would have to uh, obviously be invited to attend. Um, but are there other ideas that anyone feels we've missed that you'd like to share in the chat? Um, and, and let us know uh, how we could adjust our sort of intentions for how this would be rolled out and shared more widely. Um, and I think even, if we are talking about targeting child protection actors, we would like to share it, um, you know, across across the humanitarian response field. Okay, so as I say, people can continue to uh, su make suggestions in the chat, um, but if we can move on to the next slide and I'll hand back over to Audrey. Great, thank you. And um, thank you everyone for being on time, even, even sometimes in advance, very impressed. Um, so please continue to uh, write some of your ideas uh, in the chat box um, to Hannah and, and Nidhi. We will be moving to the closing, closing first of this session and then closing of the day with some announcement for tomorrow. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Fantastic. So, as uh, as Hannah and, and Nidhi explained, the next step will be drafting and dissemination of the updated IDEO guidance note. Um, in case you haven't heard me, right after in the coffee lounge, uh, you will be able to join me uh, to hear more about the silent pandemic presentation that Juliet and Juan uh, did earlier to this session. Um, so it we will learn more about uh, child protection sector, advocating for integration of MHPSS. Um, so very exciting and I quite like the idea of having a coffee discussion, you know. It's about lunchtime on one side of the world and it's about, you know, evening on the other side. I can see ourselves. So you go to the welcome after this session, you'll go to the welcome desk, you click on Coffee Lounge and you join us to the uh, gathering place. Um, and I think we can stop sharing the, the slides for the moment. And I will turn to Hani for some of the takeaway of uh, this incredible day that we had today. Yeah, and truly it was an incredible day. Um, there were some really interesting presentations, both in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, in the morning, we, we talked about some of the work across sectors. Um, there were some really interesting results shown uh, about how um, working with other sectors like food security, health, uh, mental health, um, working with caregivers actually work to prevent child protection uh, negative outcomes. Um, we saw some really strong evidence on, um, um, on nutrition, health, MHPSS, and protection and childcare combined in a program uh, and how it had very strong results for children. Um, there were some really inspiring discussions around uh, the overarching goal of the, of the strategy um, that we just introduced to all of you guys today. Uh, it was very interesting to hear the speakers um, at the opening of, of the strategy session talk about or encouraging the alliance to be bold um, and to take to take action to make uh, centrality of, of children and their protection a reality. Um, the interconnectedness of, of the four strategies of, that are outlined in the alliance were highlighted multiple times. Um, kind of suggesting the coherence that exists across them. Um, it, was, uh, it was noted that the strategy is exciting and it's ambitious um, and it will set us up for a, for a very exciting journey. Um, and of course, our, our website crashed. <laughs> we hope that it wasn't because our website is weak, but it was because there was so much interest and in clicking on it. Um, yeah, so those are some some quick recap from the day. Really, thanks everyone for for making it such a special day. We still have over eighty, almost ninety people still at, at the end of the day with us. And as Audrey say, hopefully some of you will end up in the coffee lounge. Over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so before leaving, uh, first of all, do not forget to fill your daily survey to let us know. How you feel? How has been your day with us? And then I just wanted to um, inform you that tomorrow we will start at 1.30 CET time, European time, with the marketplace of the working groups and task force leads, uh, where you will be able to either uh, learn more about the work that they are doing, discover maybe about the work that they are doing and believe me they have been working hard to put some very informative and uh interesting sessions so looking forward to welcoming you tomorrow at 1 30 cet time for a good marketplace where you will be able to go back home with plenty of new ideas and uh, tools and resources uh, in your virtual luggage on this note um would like to wish you a very good evening rest of your day afternoon maybe night and for the ones who would like to know more about the silent pandemic presentation follow me into the coffee lounge thank you very much everyone and see you very soon <laughs>